often in the Christian world, an unclear statement becomes a pillar. What do I mean by a pillar? It becomes a major teaching, a soapbox almost. An unclear statement, how could we do that? And yet that's done all the time in the Christian world. The many clear ones are neglected. And what has resulted is a multiplicity of confusion now with all kinds of different isms, maybe thousands of them. We see that in subjects like the Sabbath, the state of the dead, the millennium. Many clear statements in the Bible on all these subjects. Um, the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days. These are all pillars, by the way. The second coming. The gospel. And we're challenged as we, as we uh, think about these things to seek help from heaven. We too are in danger. Jesus wants a church united on truth. We need to avoid the idea that we have it all, that we understand everything, that we have the truth. Sometimes that becomes a, a stumbling block to ourselves so that we don't have to spend time in the Word every day. Uh, if we ever come, Lord help us if we ever come to that situation. The result is that we too could be led to unscriptural ideas. Avoid being programmed that way. I want to suggest today that there are some ideas that will help us to carry the message of three angels in the towns and communities where we live. There are some things that we can do. Someone aptly placed a sign at the exit to our church campus. It's also the entrance, but when we go home, it's the exit, right? Have you seen the little sign? You are now entering your what? Your mission field. You're now entering your mission field. I don't know who did that, but I like it. One of the first things we can do in making the Bible interesting and meaningful is to develop a grasp, a sense of the overall outline of the Bible. The storyline. The Bible has a storyline. This storyline doesn't just leave you hanging out there someplace with some false doctrines, but there is a storyline in Scripture. The Old Testament develops the story from the creation of the world, the fall of man, down to the coming of the seed, who is Jesus Christ. He is the seed. Jesus hanging on the cross is the gospel. That seed planted in the heart of fallen men springs forth to eternal life through a new birth into the family of God. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become what? New. I'd like to hear from you. The focus of the promised seed was made to Adam and Eve and renewed with Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and a host of others. And it has its focus in Jesus the Messiah who would come. In fact, the whole Old Testament just moves to that point where Jesus, the great God of heaven, would come and be born here, one of us. The gospel is the golden thread that spreads, that, that spans the book from cover to cover. And as Martin Luther once aptly said, the Old Testament is the swaddling clothes wherein lies the Savior. The swaddling clothes wherein lies the Savior. That's what the Old Testament is. That's what we must see in the Old Testament. The Old Testament laws and ceremonies in Moses were covenantal and were in themselves a prophecy. The Old Testament, I think if we look at the Old Testament as a, as a great, huge prophecy pointing forward to the, to the promised seed, pointing forward to Jesus, and they find their fulfillment in Christ with his character of love and his self-sacrifice, the things that he's done for us, and now his high priestly ministry in heaven. The New Testament, on the other hand, is the fulfillment of that promise. That's the storyline. The Old Testament is a prophecy pointing forward to Messiah. And the New Testament is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus 
is that golden thread. In uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, it says that Jesus is our Passover, sacrificed for us. He is the reality of the old. So, number one in our understanding of the Bible and our being able to present it to others is to be able to present it to them with the storyline. It's important that we have an understanding of that storyline. Secondly, we must let the New Testament interpret the Old Testament. Now, what do I mean by that? We must let the New Testament interpret the Old Testament. Um, does that sound strange to you? A strange idea? Let me explain. The New Testament is the unfolding of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. That's what the New Testament is. The Old Testament prophets may or may not be meant to be literal. I'm going to give you an example. In Isaiah, he declared that God, was, God would place a foundation stone in Zion. Wayne read about that this morning in the New Testament, right? A foundation stone in Zion. It would be a cornerstone in the temple, in a temple. A foundation stone that would support a building in the time of wind and hail. Isaiah talked about that. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. Isaiah 28, verse 16. <clears throat> Isaiah 28, verse 16. If you have it, say amen. amen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation stone. Somebody asked me where that was, and I couldn't recall it, and uh, that person can see it right now in Isaiah, right? A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. He does not say in the prophecy that that, means a, that, 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 that stone means a person. He doesn't say that in the prophecy. He said, I'm laying a foundation stone. He doesn't say that that's a person. Or a literal temple in the end time. He doesn't say that either. But indeed, it's a veiled prophecy of Christ. The New Testament interprets it for us. The stone that the builders rejected is Christ. And here we need the, build, and here we need the New Testament to interpret that for us. Jesus talked about it. In 1 Peter 2, verse 6, that was in our scripture reading this morning. He nails it. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief what? Cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believes on him, referring to Jesus, shall not be confounded. This stone has no, this stone has no New Testament reference to a temple being built over in Israel, as so many are teaching today. It's talking about a person that was predicted in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament literally just moves to that one point when Jesus would be born. In fact, there are a lot of prophets in the Old Testament. There's only one of them that really, in a primary sense, takes us down to the end of time, the time in which we live. All the others, we could name them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah, there's a whole group of them. Their primary application is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the covenant promise that God made with Adam and Eve and Noah. They all move to the point of the first coming of Jesus, except one. What is that one? The little book of Daniel. Now, that doesn't mean that we can have secondary fulfillments in Ezekiel and, and apply them to our time. But their primary focus is what? The Christ event. The coming of Jesus as the Messiah. The great cornerstone. The same Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, spoke of a highway building program in the desert to make way for the king of Israel. You can read about that in Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4. He says in that prophecy that every hill will be leveled and every valley will be exalted, a huge plain, okay, a highway. 
A highway for what? Some in our day would see this Old Testament prophecy as being fulfilled in freeways that the Israelis have built in Palestine in our day in order to be able to fight off enemies like China and Iran and uh, Russia. In fact, that's a very popular teaching right now, that highway. For defense purposes from their enemies. But the New Testament authoritatively interprets the prophecy for us as meeting the mission of John the Baptist, preparing a highway for who? For the Messiah, okay. Highway for the Messiah. Mission of John the Baptist. And then he speaks of Elijah's coming before the day of the Lord. When we read the New Testament, Elijah turns out to be John the Baptist. Not a literal highway in Palestine to fend off enemies, but the primary application of that prophecy is when? When Jesus came the very first time. It was he who prepared the way, John the Baptist, the symbolic highway for the introduction of Jesus to the world. Now that doesn't mean that there could be some secondary applications of that, but that's not the primary application. It all points to Jesus. The whole Bible is about him. We can't even begin to understand the importance and privilege of building that highway. And the highway yet to be built, preparing the way for the second coming of Jesus. Who's going to build that highway? Another Elijah message, right? <clears throat> preparing the way for the second coming by a remnant of God's people just before that great event, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. We call it the Elijah message. Important? Indeed, and extremely important. It takes the New Testament to interpret for us as the storyline unfolds. The Old Testament prophet Amos writes about the time when God would raise up a tabernacle of David that is fallen and build it as in the days of old. Amos talked about that, building a temple as in the days of old. The rebuilding of another Solomon's temple over in Palestine? No, because what is the primary purpose of the Old Testament prophets? To prepare the way for Jesus, to point him out as coming in the future. Is it to rebuild an end time tabernacle over in Palestine? No, but the New, Terpet New Testament interprets it for us. Let's turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. And after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof. I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles of whom my upon whom my name is called, says the Lord, who does all these things. You know, there's a sense in which 536 B.C., what happened in 536 B.C.? Anybody remember? What happened in 536 B.C.? Cyrus made a, made a decree that the Jews could go back and rebuild the Jerusalem, right? Rebuild Jerusalem. The wall, temple, city. What happened in 1844? I want to suggest that 536 is a type of 1844. What's to happen in 1844, under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be restored to its rightful state, Revised Standard Version. Building a temple. Who's building that temple? <laughs> we all have a part in that, right? A temple built of what? Lively stones, people. That's what the temple is in the last days. In the New Testament, it refers and interprets Amos for us that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost raised up the Christian church. 
And we, even today, are engaged in building a temple of lively stones as we seek to carry the gospel to the world. That was in your scripture reading this morning, 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. That's our work. Not only did the, does the New Testament show us how to interpret covenantal prophecies of the Old Testament, which all point to Christ, and not the work of the Antichrist, or as our futurist friends would interpret these Old Testament prophecies, but to be accomplished within Daniel's 70th week. All those blessings have their primary application to Daniel's 70th week. What would be accomplished in Daniel's 70th week? The Old Testament prophecies all point forward to that. Daniel spells it out. Let's look at it. Daniel, the ninth chapter. Daniel's in great distress. And Daniel receives a visitor by the name of Gabriel. And Gabriel begins to tell him some things. Let's look, uh, first of all, at uh, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people. What is the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9? What, what, what is that all about? How long is that, 70 weeks? 490 days, right? And day for a year is 490 years. That would be given for the Jewish people from Daniel's time, given to the Jewish people to be ready for the Messiah, to build a highway, if you will. Be prepared for the Messiah. You know, the sad part of the Bible, one of the saddest verses is in John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, and his own received him not. How come? You think it's important for us to be students of prophecy? So we know what time it is when we're living in right now? What day it is, what we're living? Here it is, verse 24. Seventy, works are, Seventy weeks are determined upon your people, or given to your people, or cut off for your people, as some translations have it. Seventy weeks, and upon the holy city to finish transgression, there's number one. Who did that? Who finished transgression? Has transgression been finished? Yes, in the person of one, right? He lived a perfect holy life. He was one of us. And he lived a perfect, holy life. To make reconcili reconciliation for iniquity. Did Jesus do that? Yeah. yeah. Within this 70 weeks. 490 years. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Did Jesus do that? Yeah. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision and prophecy. Anoint the most holy. All those happened within that 70-week period. That, that, that prophecy points us down right to the time when Jesus would come the first time. There it is in Daniel. But Daniel reaches beyond that. The same starting date, starting date gives us 1844, which is a type, which is an antitype of 536, rebuilding a temple. Not only does the New Testament show us how to interpret the covenant promises, which all point to Christ, but not the work of the Antichrist. We don't want the Antichrist to take the place of Christ, right? That's what this prophecy is all about. It also shows us how to interpret. The New Testament also shows us how to interpret the laws of the Old Testament. Are there laws in the Old Testament? Yeah. The Old Testament is composed of law and prophets, right? First five books of the Bible are the laws of who? Moses, okay? So let me say this again. The New Testament shows us how the ceremonial laws have met their striking fulfillment in the life and experience of Jesus. The example is one I quoted, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, which says that Jesus, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. But not all of the Old Testament laws are ceremonial in nature. Can you think of some laws in the Old Testament that are not ceremonial in nature, that are pointing forward to something? How about the moral law of Ten Commandments? Psalms 
Some of them are moral laws for all time. They're principles. Principles never change. What is the difference between a principle and a policy? What's the difference between a principle and a policy? We might have a policy come along in which we say that we should stop at this little stop line in the, in this, in, engraven in the driveway. Why would we do that? Why would we put a stop sign there? Because there's traffic on that pathway, right? I almost hit somebody one night. <laughs> it was all, no reflectors and, you know, and so that's a, that's a good policy, don't you think so? Now what happens if they take the pathway away and don't have it anymore? The policy goes away, there's no need to stop then, right? For pedestrians on that pathway. So policies are subject to change, but principles never change. <clears throat> my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that goes out of my lips. If the Medes and Persians can have a law that cannot be changed, so Daniel has to be thrown into the lion's den, what about God? Can he have an eternal law? Of course he can, that never changes. Principles change. Pop Principles never change. They're design laws. They're deeply embedded in our DNA. We live better if we keep the law of God, right? We don't have guilt. You know, guilt is one of the big killers today. People are hanging, carrying great burdens of guilt and, and, uh, and stress, and the moral laws protect us from that. Just a wonderful provision, God. They're design laws. They're in our DNA. And without them, we die. Moses said the Ten Commandments are for our good. How long? Always. You can find that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 24. It's still wrong to tell lies, right? And steal. It's still wrong to desecrate Sabbath. And make images to other gods. Take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It's still wrong to do all of that because those things never change. Therefore, our good, always. These great moral principles are perpetually binding. The Apostle Paul refers to a number of them as a rule of life for Christians. I would like to have us turn to, to uh, Romans chapter 13. We read this in the little class this morning, Romans chapter 13, verses eight to 10. Romans 13, eight to 10. <clears throat> the best definition of love in all the Bible. You know, there's a lot of definitions of love today. All kinds of people have definition of love. Oh, I just love this. I just love pizza. <laughs> but love is a principle. It never changes. And notice how it's characterized here in Romans 13, 8 to 10. This is the great, the great uh, gospel prophet, Paul, who talks about justification by faith alone, plus nothing, right? Notice what he says about the law. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill. We know what law he's talking about, don't we? He doesn't give all of them in this passage, all ten of them, but he, he knows, he gives us enough, we know what we're talking about here. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment. Are there other commandments? Yes. Oh, yeah. It is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What is the undergirding principle behind the law? Love. love. Yeah. If I love Wayne, I won't be lying to him. And if I love Robert out there, I won't go to his his garage in the middle of the night and steal some of his tools. Yeah, Robert's thankful about that. And if I love God supremely, I won't have any other gods before him. I won't make graven images and bow down to them. I won't take his name in vain, and I'll keep Sabbath holy. Jesus once said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Sabbath is probably the most important one of the whole group because it spells out who's God. Who, it spells out God's name. It's the place of his name. In the Old Testament, in numerous places, it says that the sanctuary is the place of God's name. 
Where in the sanctuary is the place of God's name? In the most holy place in the law of God, right? The Lord thy God, it says. That's his name. He says, I'll not give it to another. He says, the law, the name of God, I'm the Lord, that is my name. Found in the, found in the fourth commandment. So, uh, the law of God. The New Testament interprets the moral laws as still binding. I believe that. The Sermon on the Mount interprets the moral principles of Ten Commandments, and instead of lessening their binding claims, he strengthens their demand to holiness. Sermon on the Mount. Sometime you get an afternoon when you, maybe a Sabbath afternoon would be a good time. Read the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. If you have a red-letter edition, it's all red. He's taking the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and he's teaching the real moral principles behind the law. If, for instance, if you think evil of your brother, and you hate your brother, you've already murdered him in your mind, right? And so he takes the law and drills down on it, even to the thoughts and intents of the heart. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, that's in that, in that passage, he says, uh, the law of God. I didn't come to destroy it, but I came to fulfill it, to fill it full of meaning, to magnify it and make it honorable. New Testament interpreting the old. Jesus claimed authority, for instance, to interpret the law when a dispute came up over how to keep the Sabbath. He claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And he interpreted the law for them Jesus, the Lord, allows works of mercy and necessity to be performed on the Sabbath. He, in, he enlightened the law, magnified it in that sense. All this shows how, to, how important it is to allow the New Testament to interpret the Old. Some haven't done that. But James upholds the law of Ten Commandments to be a law of liberty for Christians. In James chapter 2, he says, that if you break one, how many of them do you break? All of them. All this goes to show how important it is for the New Testament to interpret the Old for us. Spend time in both the Old and the New Testament when you're reading the Bible. Now the third rule of interpretation. The Gospels must be interpreted by the letters. Now what are the letters? <laughs> They're those books that were written to churches like, like uh, Ephesians and Corinthians and the letters. I want to say this again. The Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John must be interpreted by the epistles, by these letters. The letters of experience by Paul and John and Peter, those are letters. And they interpret for us the Gospels. What are the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gospels tell the story of Christ, of the Christ event. They lay out for us the history of the Christ event. The teachings of Jesus. <clears throat> and the epistles tell us what it means. This is an important idea. By themselves, the historic events in the Gospels are not sufficient. We need an authoritative word that tells us the significance of these events that unlock their meaning. Let's take an example. In the Gospels, in Luke chapter 24, we find the story of the resurrection, right? Two good men came there and they begged the body of Jesus and they took his body down off the cross. He goes into the grave. And then chapter 24 says he comes up out of the grave very early in the morning on the first day of the week. Resurrection. It's not for us to presume what the resurrection means, right? And develop our own truth. Some have taught that the resurrection is a memorial to be celebrated on the first day of the week. Uh, Easter, for instance. 
Some have said that. Now, Luke 24 tells the story, but when we go to Paul, we see a memorial that is truly astounding. What does the resurrection really mean? Does it mean that we should keep Sunday as the first day for a worship, for a worship day? There's no place in the Bible that says that, but notice what the Bible does say as the letter interprets the gospel. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6. Two, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 2 to 4. Here's what the resurrection means. The letter interprets the resurrection for us. It says here in verse 2, Romans 6, well, let's start with verse uh, 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his what? death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Life. Newness of life. Yeah. Okay. For if we were planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. resurrection. He's talking about the resurrection here. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that hereafter we should not serve sin. So the letter, what does the letter say about the resurrection? It's a memorial of the new life we have in Christ. When Jesus comes out of the grave, he takes every one of us out of the grave with him. Amen. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, right? And so every generation, starting with Adam and Eve, every generation have felt the benefit of his resurrection. Galatians 2.20 <clears throat> Galatians 2.20. We all know that, what that one says. If somebody saw it, says it, knows it, recite it for us. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's what the resurrection is about. He's not in the grave anymore. And let's look at another one. Galatians 3.27. Let's look at this one. Galatians 3, verse 27. This talks about baptism. Galatians 3.27. It says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have done what? Put on Christ. Baptized into Christ. Put on Christ. That's the new life that we have in him. That is the resurrection life. That's the memorial of his resurrection. The resurrection is a symbol of new birth. The new life in Christ. We can celebrate that how often? Every day. How, how often do you experience the new birth? Every day. How often do we die? Every day. If we don't do that, we forget, right? We can live for a whole week and not die. Guess what? We're on to all kinds of mischief if we do something like that. That's a terrible thing. Paul said, I die daily. daily. So the... Re the resurrection is a symbol of the new life in Christ. The church has often failed to follow the fundamental principle of, of the gospels being interpreted by the, by the letters. Uh, baptism is a memorial of the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Every time we see a baptism, we're reminded again of the resurrection. Most of the Christian world celebrates a false Sabbath as a memorial to the resurrection with no firm foundation in Scripture. The church is in danger of trying to justify custom by drawing some spiritual lesson from the death and resurrection of Christ without consulting the epistles. Rule number four. This one may not be as apparent to you. And that is... The incidental, what do I mean by incidental? Happens once in a while in scripture, right? The incidental must be interpreted by the systematic. Now, let me explain. 
When we want to learn about what justification by faith is, where do we go? Do we go to James? <laughs> or Titus? As important as those books are, they're incidental to justification by faith, that that's our topic, right? Because in Titus and James, we are told what the new life in Christ is like, right? How we, how we are supposed to perform, how we're supposed to relate to one another. They're the incidental when we're talking about justification. <laughs> They're the syst systematic if we're talking about sanctification because they talk about the new life. You know, I don't think Martin Luther really understood this principle himself very well because he didn't think the book of James should be in the, in the, in the scripture. <laughs> it certainly has a place because it shows us what the new life in Christ is like, right? How do Christians behave themselves? I think James wrote that because he was around churches, Christian churches a little bit, and he saw that there was a need to tell them what it means to have a new life in Christ, what sanctification is really like. But when we're talking about justification, we're talking about something that does not, is not involved with human performance, but the righteousness of Christ, okay? And that sanctification is a fruit of being justified. So uh, there's an example. For example, in Titus, the author clearly is talking about the sanctified life of, of a justified, forgiven believer. That's what Titus is talking about. That's what James is talking about. A believer who has who is a justified believer, who has invited Holy Spirit into his life, and now he's living, a, a, his performance is growing more and more every day, more and more like the life of Jesus, right? He's becoming more and more like Christ every day. Good works are the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the gospel. These good works are the resu result of accepting Jesus, as Lamont said this morning, in a meaningful way. A meaningful way. What an idea. James is another example of incidental when we're talking about justification. In James, if you take the incidental and not interpret it with the clarity of the systemic, which is in Romans, the first eight chapters, or Galatians, chapter three, if you do that, where the Bible is really des describing justification, one might declare that justification is by works. That's not, a, that's not a Bible idea at all, right? Justification by works? In fact, James says that in one spot. <laughs> if you go to the book of James, you'll find that. But James, on the subject of justification, is the incidental, not the, not the, not the one that really systematically teaches uh, justification. James is talking about Christian behavior in the sanctified believer, in the justified believer. If we don't follow that principle, it can lead us to a legalistic experience. What would you think about a person that read nothing but the book of James? And yet James is wonderful. Tells how Christians behave themselves. I need more of that. That's the law, right? That's what the law is. James is the law in the New Testament. To lead to a legalistic experience, that's good, good Catholic doctrine, right out of the Council of Trent, but not the everlasting gospel which we're to proclaim with power to the world. When we read James and Titus, and we should read them often, James and Titus, we're reading about performance, about the law, and we might be tempted to do this, ah, that's good stuff here. Indeed, it's good. But when we read the law, we must be careful not to put it in the room of justification and ignore the glorious gospel of Jesus and, and go on with a performance trip and call it the gospel. That's terrible violence to the, to the Bible. We have the gospel, the everlasting gospel to, to, to present to the world. We need to make sure that our gospel is the purest gospel.
Well, I'm going to leave some of this out. Paul warned the Galatians about a false gospel. A false gospel indeed. Yes, we need the law and more of it. But we don't need to confuse it with the glory, good news, the glad tidings of Jesus, the gospel. The law points us to Jesus and him crucified so that we have access to his work for us. We must be careful when we're talking about the gospel to relate it to the doing and suffering of Jesus. That's the gospel. In fact, probably one of the best definitions of the gospel in the whole New Testament is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 5, 1 to 4. I'd like to have us just look at that for a moment. And we're just about done here. 1 Corinthians, you know, that's always the problem of having too much material, right? In preparing a sermon. Sometimes I get off the notes, and guess what happens? It takes more time. And everybody that's been in this desk knows what this, what this does. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. Here's the, probably the best definition of the gospel in all the word. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I have preached to you, which also you have received, wherein you are, and wherein you stand. We have standing in the gospel. That's what justification is. Now verse 2. By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory that I, what I preach to you, unless I, you have believed in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. There's the gospel in a nutshell. It's about Jesus. Hanging on the Christ, cross, Christ is the gospel. And everything that comes after that is a fruit. If we give ourselves to Jesus and give ourselves in faith to this, then there will be fruit in our lives. That's what Paul and the epistles spent their lives with. Wearing out their shoes to proclaim the gospel. They proclaimed the resurrection all around the place. And there were results. Lives were changed. People didn't steal anymore. People didn't lie anymore or kill anymore, or wring their hands with worry and fear. They didn't do that anymore. Why? Because they'd heard the gospel. That was the fruit of what they were teaching. And the Holy Spirit brought about the new birth, new birth and a change, the fruit of hearing the gospel. Old things passed away, and behold, all things became what? New. You want newness in your life? Study the gospel. The law leads you to it. It's gives you your need to even talk about it or think about it. These changes wrought out the new birth were the evidence that the gospel of Jesus was doing its work as the fruits of the Spirit appeared. The things that James and Titus are, call, are, are calling for are the fruits given to every life that has given their self to Jesus. Give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your what? very first work and then allow the Holy Spirit to come in. You know, when we do that, we've given the Holy Spirit permission now to come in and to cut away from our character those things that are unlike Jesus. We give him permission to do that when we give ourselves to Jesus. We need both law and gospel. The Bible is both law and gospel. And sometimes you see it on the same, in the same verse, often in the same chapter, and always within the same book. Law and gospel, we need them both. One points us to the gospel. And when we give ourselves in justification, justification will take place, and sanctification is the result, the fruit of hearing. Mm -hmm.